Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to noontime prayer and the reading of the Psalms together. Um, I hope you're all well today and staying home and staying quarantined and staying safe. We've been doing all kinds of things during the quarantine. Nancy and I have been making a puzzle in the evenings and I've been baking. I, uh, two days ago, I baked two, two loaves of bread. We ran out of bread. So the first time ever I made bread and that was fun learning how to make bread. And then yesterday, um, I made Swedish pancakes so that uh, I can't eat them because of the sugar in them, but my mom, my mom and uh, Nicole can eat them. I don't think Nancy uh, can eat them, but uh, gives uh, ready breakfast for people. And so I'm curious as to what you're doing uh, in your time at home. I hope you're uh, resting as well as working. Uh, I know there's always a lot to do, but he also calls us to rest. He makes us lie down in green pastures. He leads us beside still waters. So we begin with prayer today, and the Lord put on my heart uh, the city of New York and the state of New York. Right now, uh, in, in New York State, there has been 75,795 uh, known cases, which is um, nearing that of Italy and of China for the whole countries. New York City itself has 43,139 cases as of yesterday. Uh, the death toll uh, as of yesterday was uh, 1,550 people, and over a 1,000 of those were in New York City. This city that has sustained so much grief with 9-11 and uh, now is the focus of the coronavirus and the uh, epidemic and the pandemic in our country. Seattle's doing really well, um, a lot better. New Jersey is also really hard hit. So let's uh, turn in prayer and uh, pray for New York City and for the state of New York. Dear Heavenly Father, I just, um, I am struck with that picture of the grief that this city has already sustained in the 9-11 attacks. And now this same city is under the throes of a pandemic which is taking more and more lives. Hospitals are overrun from what I've heard. Um, they're running out of um, personal protective equipment, masks, goggles, uh, face shields, all of those different things that they use. So Father, we just pray that you would uh, give Mayor de, de Blasio, whatever we think of him politically doesn't matter, Lord. We pray that you would give him much mercy and grace. We know that you love the city of New York Oh, New York, New York, how long has, the, uh, uh, has Jesus wanted to gather you together as a mother hen gathers her chicks beneath her wings, but you were not willing? Father, I know there's a lot of believers in New York City and New York State, but we ask that you would um, use this crisis as a means of turning uh, people's hearts to you. May the city cry out to you for help for deliverance. I pray for Mayor, Mayor de, Bra, de, de Brasio, Lord, that you would uh, grant him wisdom, understanding, skill, uh, beyond his own capacities, Lord, that you would grant, grant the city government everything they need to know how to proceed uh, to get this pandemic uh, slowed down, the curve to flatten, um, we pray that um, on both sides, Republican and Democrat, that both sides could put aside politics and approach this in a bipartisan uh, fashion, Lord, that they might care for the people of the state of New York and the city of, of, of New York. Father, we also pray for the people of New York and for New York City, Lord. We pray that you would help them to stay sequestered and where they need food, uh, you would provide them food in a safe way where they could go out to the grocery store in a safe manner. I pray that you would meet their needs as far as finances and power and all those things uh, which uh, people have lost jobs, people have lost uh, income and, and father the um, grief is enormous. 1,500 families grieving.
1,500 families shocked by what has just happened. 1,500 families knowing, wondering what's going on. Where are you, Lord? How long, O oh Lord? How long must we wait? Again, I pray for the hospitals in New York overrun with patients now and running out of supplies. I pray for the doctors and nurses and CNA and medical assistants and uh, nurse practitioners and physician's assistants and um, respiratory therapists who are at the center of this battle also, um, x-ray technicians, even the janitors, Lord, and everyone in those hospitals, all the support staff, all the specialties. We pray that first you would protect them from getting the illness. And if they do, that the illness would be mild. We also pray that you would give them all the supplies they need to fight this battle. I was speaking with somebody yesterday on the phone who was in one of the Gulf Wars. And it reminds me that these health workers are now again on the front lines only fighting a different battle, not against human beings, but against this unseen little teeny virus. And so we pray that you would equip them, Lord, with what they need to fight this battle. I pray for Mayor or Governor Cuomo that you would also uh, give him wisdom and understanding and skill beyond his own capacity. Father, for both Mayor de Blasio and for Mayor Cuomo, Lord, we ask that you would, uh, if they don't know you, that you, they would, that you would lead them into your kingdom, that they might cry out to you for help. And if they knew they do know you, then I pray that you would lead them by the Holy Spirit to make the best decisions possible. And Father, I pray these same prayers for all the leaders across our nation, including President Trump, Trump, the leader of the Senate, Mitch McConnell, for Nancy Pelosi in the House of Representatives, for all the senators and representatives in the House, and in all of our state governments, Lord. Father, I know that this pandemic wasn't caused by you. It was caused by human greed all, all across the board, all the way down. We were too slow in responding to it. Uh, we didn't believe it. But Father, I, I cry out to you that you would deliver us from our, our sin. In our nation, we have thought that we could kick you out of schools, kick you out of government, kick you out of marriage, kick you out of just about every... Uh, institution and every good thing that you have established. But Father, we cry out to you. We cry out to you that our nation might return, return to you. Finding forgiveness and salvation and comfort and peace and eternal hope in the promise of life. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes has eternal life. Truly, truly, I say to you, she who believes has eternal life. So Father, we entrust New York City. I also think of all the homeless people in New York City, Lord, who are wandering the streets and uh, Father, I pray that you would keep them safe, give them a place to shelter safely where it will not spread to that population either, Lord. Father, we cry out that you would bring New York through this pandemic. We entrust the city of New York and the state of New York, our own state of Washington and all the states across the nation, New Jersey, Wisconsin is getting it hit hard. We entrust them into your hands and in, into your loving care, Lord. Hear us, O Lord. Hear our prayer. 
I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Sometimes it's shocking what we see in the news. Uh, I've been trying to take a moratorium uh, from the news. It's just depressing and uh, have enough in my own life to uh, worry about without having to worry about uh, the entire world right now. So it's good to give give things over to the Lord that we're anxious about. Have no anxiety about any in, about anything. Have no anxiety about anything, but in everything, but in everything, uh, let your requests be made known to God. Uh, how does it go? Have no anxiety about anything, but in everything, with prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus, will keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. So today we look at uh, Psalm 6. And um, in the heading of the psalm, it says, for the director of music with stringed in instruments. So this was done to the lyre and maybe to other kinds of stringed in instruments that they have. It was the predecessor to the guitar. According to Sheminith, we have no idea what that means. It's probably some kind of musical direction. And it's attributed to David, a psalm of David. It's a, it's a psalm of lament, of crying out to God in our sorrow and in our grief. This psalm uh, specifically is a psalm in which David cries out out of a bed of illness. He cries out because of, of some illness, unknown illness, which, from which he was suffering. And uh, so this um, psalm comes very close to home for me. Let's read it through. Psalm 6. O Lord, do not rebuke me in your anger, or discipline me in your, la in your wrath. Be merciful to me, Lord, for I am faint, O Lord. Heal me, for my bones are in agony. My soul is in anguish. How long, O Lord? How long? Turn, O Lord, and deliver me. Save me because of your unfailing love. No one remembers you when he is dead. Who praises you from the grave? I'm worn out from groaning. All night long I flood my bed with weeping and drench my couch with tears. My eyes grow weak with sorrow. They fail because of all my foes. Away from me, all you who do evil. For the Lord has heard my weeping. The Lord has heard my cry for mercy. The Lord accepts my prayer. All my enemies will be ashamed and dismayed. They will turn back in sudden disgrace. So we begin again with Psalm 6, verse 1. O Lord, do not rebuke me in your anger or discipline me in your wrath. It's very common in that culture, in Hebrew culture, that they attributed uh, disease and illness to sin. Um, it was a frequent way of thinking about it back then, and it is still with us. In my own life, I have had people, uh, when Nicole was born and she was in uh, the throes of, of that breathing trouble, and she was in the hospital, I had a fellow missionary at Japanese Missionary Language Institute who said of three of us who had different kinds of health problems going on in our life, one, one gal had lost her uh, mother, uh, another fellow, I don't remember, uh, his, his wife had lost a baby uh, in her 50s, had miscarried, and then my daughter was in uh, the hospital uh, for three and a half months at the time. And this fellow missionary gave a devotional uh, at our language school in the morning. They always began with a devotional. And he said to the three of us, it's because there is sin in your life that these things are happening to you. And I contemplated that and wondered which sin was it for, and I'm not being facetious. Don't we all have sin in our life, whether willing or unwilling sin that uh, we fall to almost every day, uh, prob uh, let's say every day? And so they, they held that conception that sin was caused uh, or that illness and disease was caused by sin. In John, uh, I have my Bible here. In John chapter 9, verse 1, Jesus is, is speaking of Jesus. And as Jesus passed by, he saw a man born blind 
uh, he saw a man blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he would be born blind? So they had this conception that illness, blindness, all these kind of maladies were caused by a sin. And in this case, was it the parent's sin while he was yet uh, in utero, uh, while he was yet in his mother's womb? Or was it his sin while in his mo mother's womb, and he had committed some grievous sin before he was born and therefore was born blind? Jesus answered, it was neither this man, it was neither that this man sinned, nor his parents, but it was so that the work, works of God might be displayed in him. Jesus says sometimes we uh, become ill so that he may use our life to display his good works. Um, but they had that conception, O oh Lord, do not rebuke me in your anger or discipline me in your wrath. So I, I think there's a sense that may, maybe he was, maybe he was aware of some sin in his life under that conception. Maybe he knew that uh, this was uh, within the will of God for his life, and he was asking to be removed out of God's will for him. We don't really know why. It doesn't really tell us other than he has this conception that uh, God might be rebuking him through this uh, illness, and he might be really angry with him. David uh, continues, and he says, Be merciful to me, Lord, for I am faint, O Lord. Be merciful to me, O Yahweh. And we know, as we've said over and over again, that that's Jesus. Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Before Abraham was born, I am, speaking of that name, Yahweh, Lord, the Lord. And so David cries out in his anguish at, with this illness. He says, be merciful to me, O Lord. He calls out for God's mercy. Mercy is not giving us what we deserve. Grace is giving us what we don't deserve. Mercy is not giving us what we do deserve. So he calls out and says, be merciful to me, Lord. I think this has both conceptions of it, about uh, mercy and grace wrapped up in that word. Be merciful to me, O Lord, for I am faint, O Lord. Boy, do I know that one. After my hip surgery, I had five episodes of near syncope where I almost passed out. Uh, the fifth time, uh, uh, the Firemen had arrived, had helped me back, were just getting me back in bed when I, I was arguing with the firemen that I did not want to go to the hospital. I was not going to go to the hospital when I had my fifth episode, and the fireman says, we're going. So I ended up in the hospital for two days. Um, Heal me, for my bones are in agony. For three years before I knew I had cancer, I had constant pain uh, down uh, low in my body. And uh, it turns out that it was uh, cancer that had gone into my bone. I don't know how long I had it in the bone. But, but David cries out, heal me, for my bones are in agony. Whatever illness he's had, maybe it was arthritis. I, I don't know what it was, but he says my bones are in, in agony. I'm sure that's a Jewish idiom that, that just means my in, inmost parts. I, I hurt down to the bone. Many of you know what that's like. Uh, we've had people with hip surgeries, bad backs, arthritis, all kinds of maladies that we suffer from. We don't think in terms of God healing anymore in our society. For uh, ages, we've turned to scientists, to doctors, to nurses. Uh, in that day, they didn't have all, all the doctors and nurses, that quality health care that we had. And so the first place they would turn to is to the Lord. And I know the Lord heals. He's healed me at least twice. Uh, significantly. The first time was that head injury when I lost my ability to speak at, as a result of my drinking. won't go into the whole story, but uh, the doctor said, I, I don't think you're going to live, Grant, because you've let it bleed for more than almost a day. And if you do live, you'll never speak again. On a third day, he came in and he said, Grant, uh, say the word bird. And I couldn't speak. I couldn't say it. I knew what it was, knew how to say it, but there was no pathway to get it out. And then my dad called supporting churches all over the United States. Ann Nimala of our church was one of those who prayed for me down in uh, her church in San Jose. She and Joe's church in San Jose. She prayed for me. And on the seventh day, Dr. Lozier came in and he said, Grant, say the word Methodist or the phrase Methodist Episcopal. And I said, Methodist Episcopal. So God has given me back words not to shout my own glory but to tell you of his glory, of his kindness, of his mercy. Be merciful to me, O Lord. What a prayer for today. Be merciful to us, O Lord. 
Do not rebuke us in your anger. Do not discipline us in your wrath. Be merciful to me, O Lord, for we are faint. Heal us, for our bones are in agony. The second time he healed me was uh, I came back from Japan with a uh, lot coronary artery. It showed it on uh, the tests. I still need an angiogram to confirm it, but it uh, showed the block coronary, ar coronary artery on a radioisotope test with a stress test. And uh, long story, but I came back, got on the table uh, three hours after getting off the plane in Tacoma General. And the doctor says, why are you here? You have a heart of a teenager. Thank you, Lord. He still, st still heals people. We've seen him heal people in our church when we've laid hands on them. Does he heal everybody? Some people will say yes. Um, I think there are times when he allows us to be sick so that his glory might be shown in us. He is doing something deeper and, and greater in us, uh, leading us to greater uh, places of faith and so on. Nevertheless, we cry out, heal us, heal me, for my bones are in agony. My soul is in anguish. So not only is he physically in pain, but he's emotionally in pain. His mind, his will, and his emotions are in, in anguish. How long, O oh Lord? How long? I love that question. He's saying, where are you? What are you doing? How long are, am I going to have to wait for you to show up? Sometimes my soul is in anguish in these days. In January of 2019, I was diagnosed with stage 4 cancer. And I've been doing really well with it. But, but the worst times are in the middle of the night when I wake up. Oftentimes my soul is in anguish. How long, O oh Lord? How long? In, in the midst of this pandemic, our souls are in anguish, O oh Lord. How long, O oh Lord? How long? How long are we going to have to wait to get through to the other side of this? And then continuing, turn, O oh Lord. Some versions say, return to me, O oh Lord, and deliver me. It's like when you're in the midst of this, it's like God has left you. Uh, heaven is steeled all over. Heaven is silent. Turn, O Lord, and deliver us. Turn, O Lord, and deliver me. What a prayer for, what a request for these days. Turn, O Lord, and deliver us. Save us because of your unfailing love. Save me because of your unfailing unfa love. That's not talking about eternal salvation there. That's asking for deliverance, for uh, to be saved from the illness, from the anguish, from... Uh, the hardship and distress. Save me because of your unfailing love. I'm reading for the, from the NIV, the newer international version uh, today. I liked the, the way it read better than the New American Standard. Uh, it was easier to read. And that unfailing love is the same thing as that long-suffering love, that steadfast love. It's covenant love. And so David is reminding God that he's in covenant with him. And that covenant promises that when you're in trouble, your covenant partner will come to your rescue, will come to your aid. And so we as a church are in covenant with the Father through the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we can remind God the Father that we are in covenant with him. Come to our rescue. Keep your end of the covenant, Father. You promised. And God cannot break his promises. And then he says this rather odd thing to our way of thinking. No one remembers you when he is dead. Who praises you from the grave? Uh, Jewish culture did not have a conception or a strong conception of the afterlife. For the most part, they believed that when you die, you're dead. Uh, it wasn't until much later uh, in Jewish history, uh, close to the time of Jesus, that they started developing the idea of resurrection and the after afterlife, or it would be rather a progressive revelation, if you, you will. My Old Testament professor, Fred Holmgren, bless his heart, uh, he told us that there was no conception of, or very little conception of, the afterlife in Hebrew culture, that they believe that when you were dead, you were dead. And I balked at that. I argued with them, and we all did. And, and yet, um, as I've studied the concept of Sheol, the grave, here it would, it would be the grave, but that's actually the word Sheol. Um, you get this uh, understanding that when people die, apart from Christ, they are dead, and they will be resurrected to judgment, but uh, they're dead. Uh, later on, we know the story of Lazarus talking to um, uh, the man who is in Hades. Um, that's 
Again, in that progressive revelation, we understand more and more as we go. No one remembers you when he is dead. Who praises you from the grave? So he says, if you let me die, Lord, you're going to lose my praise of you. Wow, what a prayer. Lord, if you let me die, Lord, you're going to lose uh, my praise of you, and you're going to lose the good work that you're doing in and through me, your work, not mine. I am worn out from gro groaning. Has it ever hurt so bad that you groan? When my hip was hurting so bad, I groaned in the middle of the night. Uh, sometimes uh, waking up Nancy uh, on the nights when she was uh, working, I would sleep downstairs so she would get a good night's sleep. All night long, I flood my my bed with weeping and drench, drench my couch with tears, his, his bed with tears. All night long, I flood my bed with weeping and drench my couch with tears. Have you ever been so sick that all you could do is cry? I know this one intimately in the middle of the night when I am overwhelmed with pain, mostly from my hip, not from the cancer any, lo any longer, but just also from the anguish of my soul. I find myself weeping bitterly, sobbing bitterly in the middle of the night, calling out to God, help me, O oh Lord. I'm worn out from groaning all night long. I flood my bed with weeping and drench my couch with tears. I know that in our society right now, in the midst of this pandemic, this is true of so many thousands of people, not only in our nation, but around the world, are people worn out from groaning, flooding their beds with tears, uh, drenching their couches with tears. My eyes grow weak with sorrow. Have you ever cried so much that your vision gets blurry? And they fail because of all my foes. Now, this is strange. He brings in uh, people who were against David in the midst of his illness. And that's that there must be sin in your life. Um, I got to tell you, when I was diagnosed with stage four cancer and that word got started getting out, I had some really hurtful uh, things that people said to me. And I don't know why they said them. One fellow colleague suggests that it was because of sin. Another colleague suggested, told me, a, he wasn't a colleague, it was a friend of a colleague's who at a restaurant told me a story about a pastor whose two daughters had to come to their own faith and um, because they didn't have their own faith. And so that pastor had to die in order that his two daughters could come to faith. And then he looked at me and he says, I think that's what the Lord is doing with you. Had another colleague, even a friend, who said, when all uh, other recourse runs out, you might think about drinking hydrogen peroxide. Um, I know people are well-meaning, but some people are just downright uh, cruel. There's that theology still with us, folks, that all illness is caused by our sin. And so there are those people out there saying right now that God has call, caused this pandemic. It's his fault, and he's judging us. Well, I, I don't know whether God is judging us or not. Uh, you can jump to that conclusion really easily. You'd have to be God to know that. So think about what you're doing when you pronounce that judgment. You're claiming to have the knowledge of God. We know that throughout the Old Testament, he visited pestilence and calamity on peoples. Um, I don't have those answers. What I do know is that he still loves the world. And in the midst of this pandemic, which was caused by likely somebody eating bat soup, uh, it's been and caused by our not taking it seriously when it came to our country. Uh, it's not, you can't trace it to one, one people group or one ethnicity. We all share equal responsibility in this pandemic. But I know in the midst of that, God's love never, never ceases, his unfailing love uh, for us. He not only loves us with unfailing love, but for God so loved the world that he gave his only son. Do you hear that? For God so loved the world, and that word so is emphatic there. It's being emphasized. He so loved the world. And who is the world? Every human being that has lived from the dawn of creation until the uh last days until that final day, the day of the Lord. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish. Whoever believes in him should not perish, 
be destroyed. Whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life, have everlasting life. My eyes grow weak with sorrow. They fail because of all my foes. Uh, you find out some strange things when you get sick. People say weird things to you. We move on and it says, Away from me, all you who do evil, for the Lord has heard my weeping. I love that image uh, that he, in the Psalms, that he keeps all of our tears in a bottle. He saves them all up. And also in, in the end of Revelation, when he says there will be no more death, no more mourning, no more pain, no more sorrow, and no more tears. No more tears. Away from me, all you who do evil, uh, for the Lord has heard my weeping. As king, David was now in his sickbed, and there were those who were contemplating the overthrow of the king, likely, or those kinds of things. They could get away with things because the king is sick. Um, but get this, the Lord had has heard David's weeping. He has heard my weeping. He has heard your weeping. He has heard the world weeping. The Lord has heard my cry for mercy. At the top of the psalm, he's praying, Lord, hear my cry. Uh, be merciful to me. Be merciful to us. And now he's declaring with confidence, the Lord has heard my cry for mercy. And get this, in the middle of this pandemic, the Lord has heard our cry for mercy. The Lord accepts our prayer. The Lord received and accepted David's prayer. The Lord receives and accepts my prayer. The Lord receives and accepts my wife's prayers. The Lord receives and accepts my daughter's prayers. The Lord receives and accepts your prayers. All my enemies, all these people who would attribute my illness to sin, all those enemies who would attribute David's illness to sin, all those would-be uh, prophets who would uh, attribute this to a judgment of God and to God causing it, will be ashamed and dismayed they will turn back in sudden disgrace. I pray for deliverance. I pray that God would bring us through, that he would make us straight, uh, straight through this pandemic and we would come out unscathed on the other side. Of course, there are things we do too uh, to stay safe, to stay home, to only go out when absolutely necessary. Uh, I went out yesterday for the first time in, in uh, many weeks or in, uh, in a couple weeks, I just drove to the post office on National and dropped the mail kind of threw it in the chute without touching it. And then I drove to the pharmacy to pick up a prescription. It wasn't ready yet. I go through the drive-thru at our, at our pharmacy. Uh, today I'll be driving to the bank through the drive-thru. But um, beyond that, we, as long as you can stay home and uh, empty your pantries and, and do what you can to, to uh, stay safe, I encourage you to do that. I find this a marvelous lament, if, if I can say that. It's kind of an oxymoron, but a marvelous lament for us in these days. So throughout this day, throughout the, these coming days, bring out Psalm 6 and raise your lament to the Father. How long, O Lord? How long? From those first verses. Verse 2, be merciful to me, O Lord, for I am faint. Heal me, for my bones are in agony. From verse 4, turn, O Lord, and deliver me. Save me because of your unfailing love. And then verse 8, the Lord has heard my weeping. The Lord has heard my cry for mercy. The Lord accepts our prayers. Amen. So there you have it. Uh, I appreciate your joining uh, me and my wife. My wife's sitting there on the couch today with me. Uh, just really enjoy having your presence with us. I will be posting this on YouTube later. Um, in a high definition video. So that if you want to watch it again, or if you want, uh, I'll post uh, links to it so others can watch it. Uh, also, um, um, tomorrow we'll be looking at Psalm 7. I haven't read it yet, so I'll be reading that this afternoon and preparing for it. I hope you can join us again tomorrow at 11.55 for the countdown, and then 12 noon for noontime prayer and the reading of Psalm 7. Let's close in prayer. Yesterday, I accidentally uh, closed in prayer without the mic on. So today I fixed that error. My apologies. Let's close in prayer. 
Father, I just thank you for today. I thank you for that psalm and how it speaks so significantly into my own life and to the lives of many of those in our church and those who are listening. Many of us are suffering, suffering from different kinds of illnesses and maladies, pains, Lord. And so, Father, we cry out to you. Remember, remember us in your mercy, Lord. Heal us, O Lord. And we thank you that you have heard our prayer. And from Paul's prayers, I pray this. And this I pray, that our love may abound still more and more in real knowledge and all discernment, so that we may approve the things that are excellent in order to be sincere and blameless until the day of Christ, having been filled with the fruit of righteousness, which comes through Jesus Christ, to the glory and praise of God. Amen. Again, thank you for uh, joining me today. Uh, we'll be back tomorrow at noon. And now for our uh, blessing as you go, uh, it will be from Ephesians 3, 20 and 21. Now to him who is able to do far more, now to him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think, according to the power that works within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Now to you who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think, according to your power that works within us, to you be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen.